All right. So, uh, youth, you guys are dismissed. And as they go out, if anyone's unsure about how to put their phone on silent, raise your hand and one of the kids will stop by on the way and help you with that. Even if they've never seen your phone before, they'll just start pushing buttons and something magically will happen. I think that's the blessing of youth. They're not afraid to just start pushing buttons, right? And who knows what those buttons might do. Um, hey, I wanted to reiterate just one thing that Susie said uh, this morning, and that is that we are glad that you are here, whether you're here with us in the room or whether you're here with us uh, joining from home. Uh, this is a place for you. And I know there's some of you here this morning that are hurting, and this is a place for you. And there are some of you here this morning that have had a super rough week, but this is a place for you. There may be some of you here this morning who are just crushing it and living an incredibly victorious life in Christ, and yet this is still a place for you, all of us here uh, together as a church family. This is a safe place. This is a place where we can all grow together and, uh, and come in whatever state we are. We're just glad, uh, glad to have you here. So um, we are going to finish the book of Revelation this morning. We're going to be in chapter 22. Uh, so you can turn there. And uh, as you're doing that, let's just pray and ask the Lord once again to just really bless our time uh, as we go to his word today. So Father, we do thank you for this place, Lord. We thank you for this church family, Father. We thank you for the work that you're doing in each one of us individually, Lord, and the, um, the fresh work that you're doing in our body, Lord, uh, corporately. And so we pray that that work would continue, Lord, that you'd continue to lead and guide and direct by your spirit, Lord. And we pray most of all, Lord, this morning as we go to your word, Lord, and look at this final incredible chapter of this wonderful book. Lord, we pray the same prayer we pray each and every week, Lord, that your spirit would be our teacher, Lord, that the, the teaching ministry of your spirit would be manifest here this morning, and that you would prepare our hearts for what it is you want to speak to us, Lord, um, individually and collectively. And so we thank you, Lord, and we trust that you'll do that now. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, uh, Revelation 22, and if you don't have a Bible, you might want to have a Bible just to make sure I'm not making stuff up. Um, and if you need one, you can raise your hand and one of the guys will grab one and bring it to you. Uh, you can use one on your phone. Uh, I teach from the New King James Version if you want to follow along in that version, but whatever version you use is, uh, is certainly fine uh, as long as it makes sense to you. So, uh, Revelation chapter 22. We have seen so much, haven't we, in this last about six months, I think it's been. Beginning, of course, back in chapter 1, we began with this glorious revelation of the Lord Jesus, but now in his glorified state. In, in chapters 2 and 3, you remember, we really sort of took our time and we savored these messages that he was sending to these seven churches, the seven churches there in Asia Minor, churches that existed at the time of John's writing of this. They were messages of commendation. They were also messages of exhortation. And we, we just took our time because they're so applicable, not only for those churches specifically, but certainly for all of God's people and for us today uh, collectively. In chapters four and five, Remember, we saw such a beautiful picture of the rapture of the church transported there into heaven and into the throne room of God. We watched the, the slain lamb take the sealed scroll, that title deed to the earth as man had sort of defaulted on our responsibilities. And yet now the lamb was going to begin to loose those seals and to redeem the creation. And then beginning in chapter 6, then continuing all the way up through chapter 16, we watched as these three separate sets of judgments are going to be poured out upon the earth. The seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, the bowl judgments, all of these a part of bringing an end 
to the rebellion of man and really of purifying and of preparing the way for the righteous rule of Jesus. Along the way, sort of interspersed within those chapters, remember we looked in more detail at a number of these important figures that are going to play a role in this last day's drama. We looked at the Antichrist and the false prophet. We looked at Satan, right, that unholy trinity who are going to oppose God's work and oppose God's people, uh, control the world, really, during this coming seven-year tribulation period. We saw the 144,000 sealed Jewish servants. We saw the two witnesses. We looked at the souls of the martyrs that appear there under the altar in heaven. Uh, we looked at the great harlot, right? Both commercial and religious Babylon, those satanic world systems, which even now are drawing men away from the worship of the Lord. And we watched as the armies of men will assemble finally at that place called Armageddon in one final sort of the uniting to oppose Jesus only to be defeated by him as he returns at his second coming which we read about in chapter 19. In chapter 20, remember, we looked at that coming thousand-year millennial reign of Jesus, which will be followed by the great white throne judgment where the lost are going to be sentenced to an eternity separated from, from the Lord. And then last week in chapter 21, remember, we passed beyond the realm of time and into that eternity. We saw the fact that the Lord is going to make all things new, beginning first with a new heaven and a new earth, that he's preparing specifically as our eternal home where we will dwell together with him. We saw we'll dwell with him in this new relationship, right? No longer will we have to live in faith or, or relate to him by faith, but we'll be dwelling with him face to face in a complete new kind of an intimacy, just in the same way that a bride would dwell with her husband. And we'll be dwelling there in that new Jerusalem, that huge heavenly city, which we talked about is about the size of our current moon, right? The city whose builder and maker is God and whose dimensions and the description of this city just sort of defies our wildest imagination. Remember we talked about foundations and walls and gates, all of them made from the most precious, crystal clear, brilliantly colored stones that we know of today. And we saw that the light of God is just gonna be radiating and kind of reflecting and refracting off of and through all of those different surfaces. Now, as we finish up this morning with this final chapter, we're going to look at the words of an angel as well as of John and of Jesus himself about how we can live lives now in light of heaven. So it's things that we can do in our present to ensure that we are really ready for this future. And as we begin in these first five verses, we're going to move from this incredible kind of an exterior view of the new Jerusalem to now some of those things as we're going to find as we enter in to the interior of that city. It's the blessing of life in heaven. And it says in verse 1 of Revelation chapter 22, John writes that he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now you guys know that throughout the Old Testament, God's prophets would often use this picture of a flowing river as a very kind of a powerful expression of peace and of satisfaction or of refreshing and restoration or of richness and of God's provision. You think about the prophet Isaiah, right? And God making this promise to Israel after her captivity. In Isaiah chapter 43, the Lord said, Behold, I will do what? A new thing. He said, Now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. 
We think about the psalmist, right, in Psalm 42, where he writes that as the deer pants for the water brooks, so I pant, or so, pardon me, so pants my soul for you, O God. So again, these pictures of satisfaction and of fulfillment and of refreshing. And now here what we see is in this heavenly city, we see that all of that is going to flow freely and continuously right through the heart of the city because it flows directly from the throne of God himself. Clear, it says, as crystal. Pure, absolutely unpolluted waters because they come from God himself. So this is going to be that life-giving water that is going to satisfy forever that deep longing of our souls and really provide us with this perfect peace. I don't know about you, but I think that one of the most peaceful experiences that we can experience here on this planet is to sit by a river that is flowing. And just to kind of watch that water go by and to just really enjoy the, the beauty and the sense of peace that that produces inside of us. Heaven is going to be a very, very peaceful place. It's going to be a very, very pure place with this life-giving river. And as well, we're going to see next these life-giving trees. Look what it says in verse 2. It says that in the middle of its street... And on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, admittedly, it is a little hard to get a picture of the layout kind of of this heavenly landscaping. Many Bible students think that the sense here is of a scene, kind of a wide golden street, with this crystal clear river flowing right down the middle of it, perhaps not unlike something we might see in the canals of Holland today. And then with trees growing along down on either side, all of them of the same kind, all of them called the tree of life. And some students even suggest that the trees maybe even are kind of connected across the top, forming a sort of a, of a canopy so that the many trees are connected as one tree. And whatever the layout will actually be, I don't know about you, but I cannot wait to see it. Right? Both this river and these trees, just such a perfect picture for us of this future reality of our abundant life in this glorious city. We've got this fresh fruit that is going to be produced perpetually, which we can only assume is going to be for us to eat and to enjoy, right, month after month, it says, in our glorified bodies for all of eternity. So here we're going to enjoy this blessing eternally of this fruit from the very tree of life that Adam and Eve were prevented from consuming after they sinned in the garden, lest they would forever be alive in that fallen state. Now, I do want to make just one note. That word healing there in verse 2, where it says that the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Don't misunderstand. The sense here is not that people in heaven will be sick or be in need of any kind of medicine. The word translated healing can also probably be understood more accurately as health giving. It's for the Greek word therapeian, which is where we get our word, what? Therapeutic. And so the better sense of the things here is that this tree is providing for the eternal well-being of everyone who lives there. And in fact, the word therapeian also implies that it provides a sort of an exhilaration or an invigoration. So I don't know about you, but do you, do you ever get tired of being tired? Well, let me tell you, in heaven, that is going to be a thing of the past. Amen? Right? Both the tree of life, both this water of life are going to provide us finally and fully with that abundant life that Jesus promised us, which begins now 
but we'll enjoy in its fullness through all of eternity. Verse 3 says, There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. And there shall be no night there. They need no lamp, nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. Of course, it was the curse, right, which brought first brought about that separation from God. It, it produced that, what Paul talks about, the enmity we have with God. But in heaven... The curse is gone. All the way since the fall, we have lived with the effects of the curse. Right? All of these things that came into the human condition through the curse that were never supposed to be part of our experience, those things will be no more ever again. Right? No more sin, no temptation, no disease, no death, no pain, no sorrow, no cursed earth and trying to eke out a living from it by the sweat of our brow, no more estrangement from our creator. I don't think that any of us can really comprehend how far reaching the curse extends into this earth, into this reality. And the way that we fight every day against the result of the curse, and yet here's this precious promise that one day it is going to be gone. No more curse. And we will finally be fully restored to this relationship that we were created to enjoy with God. Right? We get the sense from this verse that we're going to be glorying constantly in his light, in this intimacy which we have never known here on earth. Again, face to face. And notice this. Not only does John says that we're going to dwell with God, but also there in verse 3, it says that we're going to serve him. Now, if you thought that you were going to be sitting around on clouds, lounging there as you strummed your heart for all of eternity, that is not at all what heaven is going to be like at all. Because we were created to be productive, Remember back in the original creation that God first prepared and then he placed Adam and Eve into the garden. Even prior to their sin and their rebellion, in Genesis 3 it says that the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden. Why? To tend and to keep it. So we were created to be cultivators. We were kind of wired to be workers. We were designed to be diligent. And in heaven, we're going to be able to do that. As we, it says there, serve him for all of eternity. Now, what are we going to be doing for him? Well, we don't exactly know. Because the text doesn't tell us specifically. But what we do know is that whatever the work is, it's going to be a blessing. It's not going to be like the back-breaking work that we're forced to do today to try to produce something from this planet because of the curse, right? No more weeds or thorns or thistles, not the sweat of our brow, or just the frustration and the futility that so often comes as a part of our work. But just imagine... All of the interests, all of the inclination that the Lord has built into each one of us will at last be fully and finally utilized there in heaven because we will finally be completely free from all the limitations or whatever financial obligations. We're going to be completely free to just focus on serving the Lord in whatever it is that he has to do for us. No more failure, no more frustration, just this perfect fulfillment, right? This abundant life as God's special servants forever and ever. Then it says in verse 6 that he said to me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants, his servants, the things which must shortly take place. So this glorious sort of garden city, right? This time when all things are going to be right at last, this pure river that flows and the life-giving 
fruit, fruit that grows, right? He says there, these things are not all too good to be true. They are true, right? These words are faithful and true because the one who uttered them, he's faithful and true. And notice there that he wanted us to know these things, right? The very same God who spoke through all of the prophets also now is speaking through the Apostle John in the book of Revelation. It's kind of the capstone, if you will. It's the conclusion of all of the revelation he's given to mankind. In other words, we can bet our very lives and we can stake our eternity on this entire book that's been given to us, right? From chapter 1 all the way through chapter 22. And sometimes I think you can read here at the end of the book of Revelation as we have this glorious description of heaven and this future that we're going to have for eternity and it really can just seem like it's too good to be true. Especially by comparison, right? Here we are in this life, the way that we deal constantly with disappointment and we deal with our own temptations and our own sin and our own failure, right? We're dealing all the time with death and with disease and with pain and with sorrow. We're dealing with kind of the daily struggle of life in this reality and all of these things. But when we read of kind of an, a reality for eternity without these things, a reality of nothing but pure beauty and pure purity and pure intimacy. We can read this description that's given to us and I think sometimes some of us might have a tendency to kind of dismiss it maybe as poetic language. Maybe it's just a fancy way of saying that it, you know, at least by some degree it's going to be somewhat better than what we have now. And yet here God, as he, you know, closes up this letter, he declares to us once again, he says, I never want you to think that what I've described here is too good to be true because it is going to happen. It is going to be a part of your history. We are going to the new heaven and the new earth and this new Jerusalem. We will be there and we will see it. And notice God wants us to know about it. He wants us to know about the reality of it even now. So much so, it says there, he sent an angel from heaven to communicate these things to John so that he could write them down so that we could read about them. And understand, God didn't need to do any of that. Right? The New Testament could have very easily ended with the book of Jude. And we would have still had the gospel message. We would have still had plenty of detail about how we're to live the Christian life. We would have had all the gospel accounts, all the letters of Paul and Peter and James and John. But understand this, that in God's economy, that heaven is much more than just a destination because heaven is meant to be a motivation. Right? Knowing that we will one day live in this heavenly city it ought to make an earthly difference in how we live our lives here and now. Remember we said last week that this, it was this vision, this hope of the heavenly city. That's what motivated the patriarchs as they walked, you know, according to the faith and the promises of God. That knowing that he was returning to heaven, that's what encouraged Jesus as he himself faced the cross. So once again, this is not a hidden book. It's a revelation from God given in order that we would understand, that we would know the history of the world in advance, all for what it's supposed to produce within us in the present. And so now in the rest of the chapter, there's something kind of interesting that happens because it appears that John's attention moves from just the viewing of eternity and of the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. And now he's kind of brought back to 90 AD with a series of these closing exhortations, the first one of which is given by Jesus himself. So we go straight from the blessing of life in heaven. Now Jesus brings our attention back and he puts it squarely now on preparing now for heaven. Look what it says in verse 7. Jesus says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words 
of, this prof- of the prophecy of this book. Jesus says, hey, this is certain. I am returning. This whole thing is going to move forward. And then he promises a very special blessing to all of those who would live in the hope of his return. All of us who would keep these truths deep within our, within our hearts and they, they would motivate us to live lives that are pleasing to him. Whenever Jesus does finally come back, we want to be found watching and we want to be found waiting for him and to be working while we wait. Right? We want to be prepared because his return, he says here, is coming quickly. Now, it was 2,000 years ago when Jesus made this promise to John. And to us, 2,000 years doesn't seem to be very quickly, does it? And yet remember what Peter says. that with, He says that with the Lord, one day is as 1,000 years and 1,000 years as one day. And so according to the way they keep track of time in heaven, Jesus has only been gone a couple days. Just a long weekend at this point, right? We talked a little bit about this idea when we saw in the very first verse of this book, back in Revelation 1.1, John said that this was the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. Now that word shortly there is actually the very same Greek word for the word quickly here, And it has the sense more so of suddenly, right? Quickly, speedily, as well as soon. That when he comes, it is going to be a surprise. It does also have that sense of rapidly. It's that Greek word antakia, and it's where we get our word tachometer. In the sense that once these prophecies that are recorded here finally begin to happen with the coming of the Lord Jesus for his church at the rapture, then things will begin to happen quickly. Things are really going to rev up at that point, if you will. And that's just what we've seen. All of these things that we've seen are going to occur within that seven-year period of the tribulation, Daniel's 70th week of his prophecy in chapter 9. All of these things jammed into seven years, it's going to make 2020 look like it was a good year, right? Here it says in verse 8, Now I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. He says, worship God. So this is the second time now that John has done this, right? He falls down, tries to worship the messenger. And like we said before, it's not because John doesn't know any better, because he does know better. But it's simply because he was overwhelmed, because all of this can be pretty overwhelming, can't it? So I think we ought to cut John a little slack He has seen this entire revelation, right, from chapter 1 through chapter 22, everything that has come in between it, what has taken us a full six months to take in, he took it all in, in one single series of visions on a Sunday afternoon, hanging out there on the island of Patmos. All of the rebellion, all of the judgment, all of the unparalleled wickedness that's going to be released during the the last days, and then finally ending up here with this glorious revelation of the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem and all of that curse being gone. He had just seen all of this with his eyes and to realize that this is where history is headed. This is the reality of the future for God's people with this kind of unbelievable blessing. It's no wonder he's filled with this huge need to worship somebody, to worship something in the light of what he's just seen. Just the way that we should be filled with that same sense each and every day. 
But notice the angel is so quick. He gives him three important words of counsel. Number one, he says, don't worship angels. Right? We are all fellow servants just like you are. The second thing he says is worship God alone because he is the only one who's deserving of our praise and our honor and our glory. And finally, he tells him this in verse 10. It says, and he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is at hand. Now, this is a super interesting verse because just 700 years before that, Daniel was told at the end of his writings that all of his prophecies would be sealed until the time of the end. That there would be kind of a mystery surrounding the things that he had just been revealed to him. And that that mystery would only start to become more clear. Right, That the, the meaning of those prophecies would become less mysterious at the time of the end. But John is told specifically by this messenger from Jesus not to seal what he had just seen not to seal what he had just recorded because the end is so near. It's like Jesus is saying, look, what you've just seen are the things that my people need to know and they need to know them right now. And so in light of this, it is crazy that such a huge part of the church today still views the book of Revelation as a sort of a sealed book. They claim that it's impossible to understand. It's kind of an impenetrable puzzle. And yet I think that we've seen, I hope that we've seen as we've gone through this, that God has given us the answer key, and it's the Old Testament. Remember we have said, and I hope we've seen, again, there are 404 verses in the book of Revelation. 278 of those verses are clear references back to the Old Testament. So the book of Revelation unfolds to the person who is willing to interpret it in light of the things that God has already told us in the Old Testament. And so the difficulty that most Christians have with this New Testament book is that they don't know the Old Testament. And so all of it seems like it's sealed up to them. And yet, just as clear as can be, it says, don't seal the words of the prophecy of this book. It's meant to be understood, and it needs to be understood before it's too late. Because look next at what the angel says to John. A little bit puzzling in verse 11. He says that he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Again, this can be a little bit puzzling, and yet the sense in the context, in the context of the fact that Jesus is coming back quickly, in the context of the fact that the words of this prophecy should be open and should be available and are necessary and can be understood, what the angel is saying here is probably more the sense that, hey, since Jesus is coming so suddenly, there won't be time for change if you wait until you see that. Right? There won't be time for any kind of last-minute repentance, but there is still time right now. What you are now is what you are going to be then. And if what someone has just read in the book of Revelation hasn't changed them, then there probably isn't much hope. Right here, the Spirit is bringing this book to an end and he's really driving home a very profound point that if a person can be completely unmoved by the prophecies of this book, if all of these warnings and these realities of the coming judgment, if the call to repentance and the call to purity, if these things won't change a person, if this message won't cause a person to turn from their sin and turn back to God then perhaps nothing will. So it is a very real sort of a heart check. He says, be careful how you leave this book. This is the truth. This is the future of the world. And so we all need to be very careful how we leave this book. 
right, how we close up this book, and to make sure that our lives are lives that are in line with an understanding that this really is the future. Again, if you are here this morning and you don't yet know the Lord, if you've never trusted in Jesus as your Savior, I would only ask that you do not close this book that we have been studying now for the last six months. I ask that you do not close this book and just continue in your sin and in your rebellion. That you just continue to be unmoved by what it is he has revealed to us because you need to be on the right side of God. You need to end up on the right side of eternity. And the Bible says that behold, today, right now is the day of salvation. And so Jesus says once again in verse 12, he says, behold, I am coming quickly. My reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments that, may they, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. So this is the second time in just six verses that Jesus jumps in and he does it to remind us of what? That he is coming quickly. We're going to see he's going to do it even a third time before we're done this morning. Anytime God repeats himself, we need to pay close attention, Right? Now, we should, of course, pay attention the first time he says something, and yet the second time and the third time? Again, this book is written so that we would realize that he is coming quickly, and that when he does, he's going to reward us for our faithfulness, and we can take that promise to the bank because... He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning from the end. He is the first and the last. He is the author of all of human history from beginning to end. In other words, he is going to finish what he began back in Genesis 1. This whole heaven and the earth and the universe and everything that God is going to have the end that he wants it to have. Right, Not the UN, not the EU, not the Illuminati or some other kind of secret cabal that are meeting places and determining the court. Right, Not the rulers of this world, not man, not anybody. God is going to be the one who brings to completion all these things he began. And it's going to have the end that he appoints it to have. And what that end is, is to eternally bless God those who keep the commandments of Jesus. What was the commandment? To trust in him as our Savior and as our Lord, and then to try to obey him as a result of that. But, it says in verse 15, outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. This is a hard word, and yet it's a true reality. And again, in these closing verses, Jesus is driving home the point that there are those who will not inherit these blessings. Those who embrace that lie of self, right? Self-sufficiency and self-satisfaction and self-determination, right? They embrace that over the truth of the word of God. And they choose to live in their sin because they love their sin more than God. They want that sin more than they want God. And so it's very clear here, they will not enter into heaven. They won't enjoy the blessings of heaven. It says in verse 16 that I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. So with these solemn words here in verse 16, it's like Jesus has just authenticated this entire book. He's reiterating and he's affirming the highest authority 
of what is written here. And notice that he uses these two very specific kind of prophetic titles to kind of highlight his work amongst his people. Historically, we know that Jesus came from the line of David. Right? He's the offspring of David and that he was born into this world as a descendant of David and through the lineage of David. But he's also the root of David. He's the creator of David. He's the one who brought David into existence. Now, prophetically, Jesus is coming like the bright and morning star. Right? It was the beginning of a bright new day when Jesus entered into the darkness of this world that had been brought by the curse. But now all of that is going to give way to a new day and a new eternity that's bright. And Jesus is the one who's going to bring all of that to pass. Not only for the creation collectively, but for every individual personally who puts their faith in him. And so the very next thing we have in verse 17, after kind of the, the reality of the blessing of life in heaven, the exhortation from him to prepare now for heaven, we have this wonderful invitation to heaven. It says in verse 17 that the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. And whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. This is so beautiful, I think, here in verse 17. Because here the Holy Spirit, it's like he just can't close the book now without throwing out the nets yet one more time. And this is an invitation that is so great that we can glory in it, in it with him right along. It says, the spirit and the bride and him who hears, all of us say what? We say come. So that anyone who desires salvation in Jesus Christ can come to him and take the water of life freely. So this is our response to the news that Jesus says he's coming again, that all this darkness is soon going to give way to a brand new light, we say, come and come now. It's nothing less than an open invitation to receive salvation from Jesus. He will not exclude anyone who comes to him that has a thirst for him. It says, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. And yet there's people all the time who will say, well, I don't understand all about Christian doctrine and Christian theology. And notice Jesus says, come anyway. It doesn't say whoever understands, let him take of the water of life. Other people might say, look, I, I know that I don't think I can repent the way that I should. My heart's too hard. I can't even sorrow over my sins. I can't even feel bad the way that I think that I should feel bad. And notice that Jesus says what? He says, come anyway. Because it doesn't say whoever feels, let him take of the water of life. There are some people who say, look, I don't know that I can live that kind of a Christian life the way that I should. And yet Jesus says what? He says, come anyway. Because it doesn't say whoever can, let him take of the water of life. And there are people all the time that say, I don't know that I'm worthy to live the Christian life. And Jesus says what? He says, come anyway. Because it doesn't say whoever is worthy, let him come and take. It simply says, let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, it says, come. And I love what Spurgeon said about this. He said, mark the sinner. It says, whosoever. What a big word that is, whosoever. There is no standard height here. It is of any height and any size. Little sinners, big sinners, dark sinners, fair sinners, sinners double-dyed, old sinners, aggravated sinners, sinners who, come, uh, who have committed every crime in the whole catalog, whosoever. And notice then that when you do come, notice that all you need to do is what? Is take. He says, take the water of life freely. That's it. That is all. 
and understand that all of the other world religions are summed up in the idea that you need to bring something to give to God. You need to bring as an offering unto the gods. But the essence of biblical Christianity is summed up in the idea that God invites us to just take of the water of life freely. You can't bring anything to save or to justify or to commend or to excuse yourself before God, but you can take that salvation that he offers so freely. It really is actually this simple. Do you desire Jesus and his salvation? Then come. Right? Can you simply say, Lord, I desire to be saved. I want you to give me a new heart. I desire to give up my sins. I desire to be a Christian. I desire to believe and I desire to obey, but I know that I don't even have the strength to do any of those things. To simply say, Jesus, I have the desire, but I need you to give me the power. So if that's your desire, then you are freely invited to come. There is no barrier between you and Jesus except your stubborn will. And I think that it is so fitting that this incredible invitation closes the book of Revelation and closes the Bible itself. Again, I love the way Spurgeon commented on this. He said that all the prophets of the Bible, all the apostles of the Bible, all the threatenings of the Bible, all the promises of the Bible gather themselves up and focus themselves into this one burning ray. Come to Jesus. Come and take the water of life freely. So all of it points, right? All that God has revealed to us in his word points to our need for his son Jesus and his desire to save us from our sins. And it's because of that that as we finish up this morning, there is a very strong admonition that comes right on the heels of this beautiful invitation. It says in verse 18, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. There is a high price to pay from tampering with the book of Revelation specifically and the scriptures as a whole generally. And this chapter just suddenly got very serious because God is very serious about his word. In Psalm 138, it says that you have magnified your word even above all your name. And certainly, this is a warning through all the ages to all the scribes who would ever copy God's word from parchment to parchment, right? All through human history. They might be tempted to maybe amend or maybe to edit things as they went. But it's also a crystal clear warning to every teacher of the word of God and of the book of Revelation because men have a tendency to want to add their theories and include their traditions and conform the word to their positions rather than just allowing God to speak for himself. Right? Trying to explain away some of the difficult things by declaring it simply to be, you know, figurative or prophetic language. I love the way that one scholar hit the nail on the head. He wrote this. He said, what a solemn warning to, this is to critics who have tampered with this book and other portions of scripture in arrogant self-confidence that they are equipped intellectually and spiritually to determine what is true and what is not true in the word of God. And this is one of the reasons that I have a problem personally with some of the other different interpretive views of the book of Revelation rather than that literal futurist view which we've looked at. 
because someone needs to spiritualize so much of the book in order to cram it into any of those other views. And I am not willing to do that just to make it easier to accept. Yes, this is heavy. When you take God at his word, it's heavy. But this is basically what it's saying. He knows the heaviness of this book. I know you guys know the heaviness of this book because I know some of you have said you've wanted to invite friends or neighbors or family members to come to church, but you want to wait to do it until after we finish this book, right? Lest they arrive at some time and, you know, all of a sudden there's the great harlot or the antichrist or hundred pound hailstones falling down on people. And I get it. I do get it. And if you think it's hard to hear it, try preaching it. And yet God knew that the great temptation that we would have as we try to explain this away or maybe we add this in just to make it a little bit more palatable and kind of pack the people in, right, and fill up the pews. But God knows what he wants to say and he knows what he needs to communicate. He knows what he wants to reveal to man and you and I cannot improve upon his revelation. And you know what? I have to say, as a pastor, I love this warning because I love it when God just takes and keeps me right in the right place. Because short of this, who knows what kind of nonsense I might come up with that people would flock in here to hear. I have to say, you know, I'm pretty clever and a little bit charming too, you know. But that's not what I'm called to do, right? What I'm called to do is to deliver this message that God has already delivered and to get us all ready for heaven. We see in these last two verses, again, not just the last two verses of this book, but these are the last two verses of the whole Bible itself so that we are living in an expectation of heaven. It says in verse 20 that he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. So this is the third time now in this closing chapter, that Jesus has reminded us himself that he is coming quickly. And just in case, just in case the statement, I am coming quickly, wasn't already enough, this third time, notice that Jesus and his Holy Spirit even put some extra emphasis here on both sides of that statement. There's a surely before and there's an amen after it because we're not very smart, right? And we need to have this called out. To the very end, this book emphasizes readiness and it emphasizes watchfulness. And if we miss this practical lesson from the book of Revelation, this lesson of readiness, then we miss one of the most essential messages of this book. But I think there's also a final beautiful emphasis on another one of the essential messages because I think here at the very close of this book, there's this kind of a confession, if you will, that all of the answers to all of the problems in life are not found in man's ability somehow to create or to improve or to make a better world. But all of those answers to all of the problems are found only in the return of the one who will finally make all things new and who will finally put all things right and whose sovereign power controls the course of human affairs. And so John writes at the end in verse 21, he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. What a great verse because here we conclude right where it was that each one of us began. Here, these are the very final words of the Bible. The last thing that the Holy Spirit speaks to us through the pen of the Apostle John as John entrusts every single person who reads this book, right? Every single one of us this morning who knows him and John commends us to the grace of God because that's how we know 
that all of this is really in our future. It's not because somehow we have earned it. It's not because we are deserving of it in any way. It's not because we're faithful. It's not because, because, because of anything we've done, but put our faith in Jesus Christ. And that very same grace that saved us is the very same grace that not God now gives to us that we might faithfully walk with him. It truly is that amazing grace. Right, That same grace that has kept us this far is that grace that's going to lead us home. And this is the truth. And somehow, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I can get so easily overwhelmed and I think we are never going to make it. Right? I am never going to make it, and yet we will by his grace. That's the reason that all of this is in our future. Yes, the trumpets are coming and the seals are coming and the bowls are coming and the Antichrist is coming and his mark is coming and all of that has its place in the history of the world, but it is grace that is going to have the final say concerning each of our lives. Right? Yes, struggle is coming and sickness is coming and struggle and pain and sorrow and even tragedy and death are coming into each one of our lives, but it's God's grace that will sustain us through all of those things. Right? Jesus promised us. He said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul determined Therefore, he said, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities or in my weakness that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And so we with Paul there and we with John here, we can add an amen. We can add it to that truth, right? So be it. And we all love stories with happy endings, especially when that happy ending involves us and our eternity. And this book has a happy ending for every single person who knows Jesus and who has really honored the Father by putting their faith in him. And God wants this to be the ending for every single person. Again, if you are here this morning and you haven't trusted Jesus as your personal Savior, if you are listening today and you haven't done that, you haven't asked him to forgive you of your sins, if you've yet to come and to drink of that water, then you can do it right now, even while I'm talking. You can simply ask him in your heart, and he will do that, and you will begin that new life in him. And everything that we've read about today will be part of your future. He would love to do that. He would love to forgive you and he will love to save you and he will love to make this your eternity no matter where it is you've been, no matter what it is you've done, what you've experienced, who you've hurt, how much you have sinned, any of those things, nothing is greater than his ability to forgive you. And can I just say this, that this same truth goes for some of you who are already believers who may have simply wandered away from his love and gotten out away from his grace and who are dry and who are parched and who are thirsty here this morning, even this morning he says to you, come and drink. Right? It says in Luke chapter 19 that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. So don't waste even one more day. Everybody, open your Bibles and read with me that one last verse again with me this morning as we finish out that amazing book. It says in verse 21 that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Amen. Father, how we do thank you, Lord, for your grace. And Lord, we thank you for your word, Lord, and for your desire that we know all of the things that you communicated through this incredible book. Lord, we thank you for the, the clear picture that you have given us of all of those things that are coming for us, Lord, that are coming to this world. And we do pray, Lord, that you would help us to live lives in light of all that you have revealed. And Father, I do pray, especially this morning, 
If there are those who don't know you, Lord, if there are those who do know you, Lord, but are far from you, Lord, I pray that they would come and that they would drink freely of that water, Lord, that they would experience either for the first time, Lord, or uh, such a powerful refreshing, Lord, of that grace that you pour out so freely and so abundantly upon us. And so we thank you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's